Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the ML in Healthcare Summit. I'm Vita, your host for this talk. I have the great privilege to welcome Shabna, one of our amazing speakers, uh, this evening. She's a PhD candidate in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at University of Toronto, a graduate fellow of Schwartz Rissman Institute for Technology and Society, and a postgraduate affiliate of Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Her PhD projects are focused on adaptive and intelligent systems for making automated vehicles usable by older adults with or without dementia to prolong their safe driving period. In these projects, she and her team use Driver Lab at University Health Network to empirically explore potential features that need to be incorporated in such intelligent system. Before starting, I just want to mention, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat section. I collect all your questions and make sure that we discuss them at the end of the talk. Without further ado, Shabnam, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Vita, for the kind introduction. I just wanted to get uh, a quick thumbs up that everybody can hear me. If uh, you can mute the chat or somewhere else to let me know, that would be perfect. Um, but I can also move on, assuming that you all are hearing me and uh, just not giving me any indication. But, um, okay. Okay, great. So uh, it's a pleasure to present our project um, with, uh, uh, this is a project with Dr. Jennifer Campos and Dr. Alex Mihalidis, which is focused on um, a method of enhancing the usability of automated vehicles among older adults. Um, using driver state monitoring systems that can detect mode confusion. And I appreciate how this might be a mouthful, but I, um, I, will, be, um, I will be going one by one. Um, I will cover main aspects of the project. First, the motivation behind why uh, we're focusing on enhancing the usability um, of automated vehicles for older adults and why this project is considered a project in health and well-being. Uh, secondly, I'll talk about um, what, is, what exactly is mode confusion and what is the, and how we have framed it in order to be able to use machine learning to, uh, to be able to detect it. And third, I'll talk about our data collection during which time I would like to make the case that similar to other use cases of uh, machine learning and healthcare, data collection is difficult, expensive, in many cases, uh, the bottleneck towards applying more sophisticated machine learning uh, algorithms to solve the issues in um, healthcare and uh, in NML. And um, at the end, I will give an overview of our uh, results. So first, motivation. Why uh, we are focusing on the enhance on enhancing the usability of automated vehicles for older adults. Um, there are two main incentives to promote the safe use of automated vehicles by older adults. One is road safety. Um, specifically, uh, we know that there are the reports that project that by 2025, age-related frailties will be the projected cause of fatal crashes. And secondly, um, another uh, reason of promoting uh, use of automated vehicles by older adults is to avoid or delay um, driving cessation, uh, which we know from the uh, from the extensive literature on this, uh, ha driving cessation can have significant adverse health uh, consequences for older adults, which range from faster cognitive decline to increased risks of institutionalization to even um, threefold um, increased risks of morbidity. Um, now. It's no wonder really uh, how automated vehicles have generated this excitement on how they may be able to solve um, these issues and support older adults to drive safer and longer and thereby avoid the health consequences of driving cessation for them. So in this sense, we are considering automated vehicles to have the potential to be uh, an assistive technology really. But what do we mean by automated vehicles? All automated vehicles are really an umbrella term that describe all the vehicles with different levels of automated functionality. Um, but, and this, what you are seeing on the slide is the most formal categorization of uh, different types of automated vehicles, um, which is based on technical plausibility. So in this sense, 
uh, each of these levels are the steps that the industry is taking towards achieving that holy grail level five here, which we often uh, call or hear in the news as autonomous vehicle or driverless cars. But if we consider this uh, 2D space, um, 2D grid word of uh, all the possible types of automated vehicles, if you will, autonomous vehicles are really just, just this one dot um, in this 2D grid space um, where um, these sets of vehicles can perform all types of auto, uh, type, sorry, all tasks um, of driving under, under all driving conditions. So 100% uh, percent of driving conditions. But the rest of automated vehicles will fall somewhere, um, somewhere here, somewhere uh, where they cannot perform all driving tasks at all times. Uh, so it's important to know that for many reasons, we are a long way away from that autonomous vehicle. These, uh, these um, reasons can range from policy legislations to consumer acceptance, um, etc. So for the time being, at least, we are left with automated vehicles that can perform some driving tasks under some uh, driving conditions and then some other driving tasks under some other driving conditions. And um, what this means is that for the time being, the functionality of an automated vehicle depends on the, on the driving condition, um, which again means that a given automated vehicle may have multiple modes or states of operation which from the user or driver perspective, I mean, uh, it makes more sense that to view automated vehicles, not in terms of the levels of technical possibility, but in terms of different modes or states. So put it in a, in a language that I, I think um, the attendees may appreciate, we can look at this as a sort of like a market chain with finite states where, um, where um, maybe to this, yeah, where the number of modes or states um, in, in an automated vehicle and the probability of transitioning between these states could be different from one automated vehicle to another, from an automated vehicle from company X to an automated vehicle from company Y. So our framework really explores how these distinct state structures for each, of, uh, each automated vehicle um, what does mean? Uh, what does this mean for the driver, and specifically for an older driver? So imagine a driver, such as uh, an older adult who has uh, used an, a non-automated vehicle so far, and is now transitioning into an to using an automated vehicle with M modes of operation, where each of these modes, as you see on the screen uh, on this left-hand side, can have a um, distinct a uh, set of responsibilities for the driver. So the driver needs to, to, to know two things uh, to be able to safely use this automated vehicle. One is that um, he or she needs to have a general awareness of the number of modes in the vehicle and, uh, and what each of these entail, which we call state structure. And secondly, the, the driver needs to, at any moment in time, know what the current active mode of the vehicle is and to know their, um, their corresponding responsibility. Uh, borrowing from the uh, aviation literature, these two types of mode awarenesses are called type one or general mode awareness and the second one is called just transient mode awareness. I'm not gonna go into details of this, but uh, for our purposes um, to explain the, uh, the, the, the framework, uh, it is important to note that mode confusion is essentially this lack of type two mode awareness or being confused about the current active mode of the automated vehicle. And we expect this mode confusion to be more likely among older adults as it draws upon uh, attention resources that could be affected uh, by age. So the safety risk of mode confusion arises uh, because each AV mode requires a distinct set of responsibilities from the driver. So if the driver, um, uh, if the driver's perception of the active mode of the automated vehicle is incongruent with the true active mode of the vehicle, uh, as is the case in mode confusion, this means that the driver is simply not doing what they should be doing. Um, in fact, a couple of recent crashes involving an automated vehicle uh, has been linked to uh, mode confusion. 
So to be able to detect mode confusion, our proposed framework is, is really based on this hypothesis over here that the driver's perceived AV state or mode influences how they monitor the environment and how um, and, and their level of mental workload. And we further hypothesize that we may be able to capture um, uh, this, uh, this, these trends um, by using the gaze behavior data from the driver. So uh, kind of reverse engineering it, it again, what you're saying is that we may be able to infer drivers perceived AV state from their gaze behavior data. And uh, in that case, we, uh, we, we then we will be able to compare it to the tree, uh, sorry, to the true uh, state of the AV and uh, declare any incongruency as mode confusion. And so as, um, as you know, any, um, any problem is really solved when, uh, when, when the question is reframed. Um, so this is a, this is a reframing of, of, uh, of this mode confusion uh, question um, in a formal um, design of a state monitoring system, where if you look up here, we, uh, the system is, um, is expected to have two general inputs. One is the sequential observation from the driver, uh, which consists of the gaze behavior data from the driver. And the second uh, input is the true AV mode, which is uh, plausibly assumed to be known to the driver uh, monitoring system because it's known to the automated vehicle. Um, now, with these two um, with these two inputs, so if we can infer uh, the perceived uh, AV mode, uh, the driver's perceived AV mode, then here uh, by comparing the perceived and true AV mode we should be able to detect mode confusions if these two are not, um, if, if these two did not match. Uh, for that in, uh, inference, we are proposing to use classification algorithms uh, to classify the features of gaze behavior into all possible modes of automated vehicles. And the rationale here is that um, by definition, um, in the mode confusion, in an instance of mode confusion, the driver is assumed to know the possible modes of an automated vehicle. So if the, if a driver is confused, this means that uh, she or he has taken one mode for the other. Uh, and I'm happy to go more into details of this because I uh, appreciate it's very complex at first sight. Uh, now I'm going to describe uh, the at how we collected the data that we applied this framework on. Um, specifically, we had 36 older adults ranging from uh, uh, ranging in age from 65 to 90 years old uh, who were self-reportedly healthy and they had um, uh, driver's licenses. Um, they tried uh, full automation and non-automation in a high fidelity full field of view uh, driving simulator. Um, but it's important to note that uh, we actually couldn't use, due to technical difficulties, a uh, number of data, the, the data that was collected. Um, so we ended up with data from 29 participants, uh, which times to this uh, six scenarios yielded one uh, 74 time series of gaze behavior data, and each of which were about seven to nine minutes in duration. This is the driving simulator uh, that we used. Um, and I'm hoping that on the screen, you're seeing the dome that the driving simulator is, uh, is in. Um, inside this dome is uh, covered all around by projectors, which you see on the picture on the right hand side. Um, and the vehicle can actually, is, is on a turntable inside this dome and the vehicle can turn around um, all over. Now moving on to the inside of the vehicle. So here um, you see that inside that dome uh, there is um, there is an actual vehicle. It's an actual it's an Audi uh, with it, all its internal components intact. Uh, so when the participants came in, uh, they uh, they they experienced um, different driving conditions and. Uh, uh, specifically two uh, modes of automation, so non-automated and fully automated, which means that in our framework, our problem was reduced to a two-class classification, which 
uh, which made sense because this is the very start of solving the, the problem of mode confusion. So it made sense to um, start with the, uh, I guess, simplest classification uh, model. Um, now, in terms of the results, um, before, uh, before I move on to the results, sorry, I need to note that the, uh, you'll, it's hard to see the cameras here, but there are four cameras mounted inside the car. Um, so these were used to non-invasively collect the gaze behavior data that we used. And what we did with this data was, uh, was to extract 25 features related to uh, drivers monitoring behavior, uh, one of which is a novel one that we introduced, but uh, almost all of these features are related to two pillars of our gaze behavior. Uh, one is known as fixation uh, or the locations uh, on which we fixate our attention to get information. And the second one is, uh, is, what we call, is, is called a saccade. Uh, which uh, is the rapid eye movement between locations of interest. Um, so there are there's a whole lot of in, um, uh, literature on how these two relate to our monitoring behavior in driving or in other tasks. But um, I'm happy to go through the, those during the question Q and A. But uh, for the purpose of this, um, it is important to know just have a good idea of what saccade and fixations are. So for instance. On the right side, you're seeing a figure um, of the fixation locations of one of our participants during their nine minute drive. Um, so these are the locations. So the average of um, these, uh, these locations in, in one cluster, if you will, that are weighted by the duration um, where, the, where the driver was focused on that location in this uh, 3D world. Uh, so the, 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 the proposed uh, the feature that we propose is essentially the entropy of, um, of these fixation locations uh, weighted uh, by the duration uh, that the driver um, fixated on that location, which uh, this feature is called. Uh, uh, so this is a uh, this is a this is a I guess a variation of a widely used feature uh, that we call weighted statistic, uh, static gaze entropy. Using um, a feature uh, selection method, uh, specifically maximum relevance, minimum redundancy, um, we, we ranked the 25 extracted features um, into, uh, into ranks from 1 to 25, where our proposed feature of weighted um, statistic, uh, sorry, static gaze entropy was ranked first. Um, and for those uh, who are not familiar with uh, MRMR a framework, uh, this is uh, this is used um, uh, th in this framework. A metric such as mutual information or F scores uh, are used to iteratively choose the most relevant feature in a bag of features um, to to the to the class labels. Um, while at the same time, this chosen feature should have minimum redundancy with the rest of the features, as I think as um, as measured by uh, Pearson uh, correlation. This is introduced uh, in uh, 2005, but uh, it, it again rose to fame in uh, 2017 from a paper by Uber. Uh, now, here you see how, um, how, sorry, moving on here, you see that we, uh, this is a result of applying one arbitrary classification. Uh, this is uh, in, in specifically is LDA on increasing number of features. Um, so, so to note, um, our our bag of features, our sorry, our data, uh, our sample was only 174. Uh, so you'll see that uh, the pattern here in this figure that with the increasing number of features, the classification performance dropped. So we use this uh, visual inspection really um, with using similar figures for each classification algorithm to choose the optimum number of features uh, resulted. Uh, for that classification using tenfold plus validation. And uh, here you see that uh, using this uh, chosen optimum number of features uh, for, uh, for a number of classes, um, here we report the, the results of tenfold uh, stratified plus validation. Um, and using uh, the metrics of accuracy on the area under the curve and F1 score, you see how 
Um, the one, the last one actually, uh, the ensemble of uh, classification models one to eight over here led to the best performance, uh, especially of interest to us was the area under the curve, which um, led us uh, to conclude that um, the case behavior data could in fact be used to differentiate between uh, perceived levels of automation from the drivers. Um, but I'm going to take this last minute uh, to talk about the limitation of this experiment, experiment um, and which is uh, which is essentially the, the 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 limitations that our data posed to us. Um, first and foremost is that the data included these behavior data for only two modes of automated vehicle, uh, which resulted in two class classification. Uh, future research really needs to apply this framework on on data from uh, more modes of compute, uh, sorry, mode, modes of automated vehicles uh, to be able to uh, test the efficacy of this framework. Uh, in addition, the data, as I described, was collected in a simulated automated vehicle, so in a driving simulator. And future studies really should uh, test the validity of this framework by applying it on real world road data because the monitoring behavior might as well be very different. Um, and, um, and the major limitation of this is that this, uh, this testing and experiment will remain as, uh, as a proof of concept, really, because no instances of mode confusion was used to be able to validate um, our, um, our last hypothesis. It's just a, uh, I guess, stepping stone toward solving this uh, issue. Um, with that, I would like you I would like to thank you all for for listening, and I'll take any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shabna, uh, for um, the great presentation and interesting talk. Let's take uh, the questions. Please feel free to ask your questions in the chat section, and I'll make sure to ask all of them to Shabna. And one question uh, is that uh, which one of the classification algorithms you've used for confusion model perform better in terms of the area under the curve? Yeah, or, uh, yeah so this, uh, it was the ensemble, uh, let me bring it up. So, uh, or just, I might as well not just share this again, but, um, so it, it was the ensemble method of like stacking the classifications of uh, multiple classifications, really LDA, QDA, AWOST, Random Forest, uh, Gaussian process, SVM, logistic regression. So it, just stacking these all together resulted in, um, in a higher AUC plus the test accuracy. But if you wanna just go with the, the most simplest version, um, LDA, um, surprisingly performed the best if we take AUC solely. So that was, that was good, surprising. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much. And um, Salim asked that, um, would this be considered uh, a novel research or perhaps a novel application towards helping the elderly? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I know for a fact that um, companies, um, such as Renault, um, like Volvo, are really focusing on mode confusion per se. So the topic of interest, because it's a safety concern for automated vehicles, but as it relates to older adults, um, as to the best of my knowledge, it, it is a novel application uh, because, um, and this is part of the reason why I, um, I talk about the motivation because it's important for companies, for us to think about um, good um, good applications of automated vehicles for good, for, for enhancing the mobility of older adults and health. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, another question maybe is that, beside from gaze behavior that you've mentioned that you've used uh, as sort of features, did you consider or do you have any uh, plan to consider other features like, I don't know, like uh, facial expression uh, and things like that to, to see what is happening? And do you think it will affect the model accuracy, maybe enhance that? 
Uh, great question. Um, absolutely. I'll just preface this with um, one one other consideration is that um, we so we only compared to two, two modes of automation and with increasing modes of automation the uh, the interactions of the driver and the vehicle becomes increasingly constrained i guess so other types of um, data such as um, like if that is to say if we include another mode that is in between full automation and no automation we may be even, even be able to use other sources such as um, you know how much they are engaged with their how to use the the steering you know so but uh, to your point, I think a video, face videos are a great idea, and we we actually have them collected. The only reason we steered away from it was uh, was just to um, to test this because it's less computationally expensive to design something on vehicle that doesn't process video. But um, absolutely, it'll be a great uh, future direction. Thank you, thank you so much, Shabna, for the great presentation. And um, thank you all for attending this talk. Thank you so much. I do